Okay, Randy, this is a really exciting day for me. I think since we started our online class, I've always been saying we got to do a podcast. And this is our first podcast. It might be our last podcast, but... (laughs) This is it. (laughs) This is it. This is the main event. This is what we've been practicing for. It better be good. Years, Years and years of practice. And uh, mm. we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, uh, we don't have any sponsors yet. I think they're supposed to break in at some point and give like, little interludes and we can hawk our products. Um, but we'll see, <laughs> we'll see what comes out of this. <laughs> so today's uh, topic of the day is, uh, well, our, our, our lesson uh, really is about meat and should I eat meat? And uh, I, as I was thinking about our relationships with uh, with animals and the work that we do, I uh, started thinking about s- some of the work and the places that we've been uh, around the world together. And yeah. I'm going to start with this, which is, all right, Randy, what's the weirdest thing that you've ever eaten? The weirdest thing I've ever eaten? Uh, probably fermented shark. You know, that is... I mean, it just like crawled up into my brainstem and didn't let go for a minute. But uh, (laughs) it didn't really feel like I was eating. Let's just put it that way. (laughs) I think I can still smell it right now, actually. If I really dig (laughs) dig deep, I can kind of... I was never sure if it was really a smell or not. It it just felt like a hand like grabbed onto my brainstem. (laughs) So fermented (laughs) shark. So you and I had fermented shark when we were in Iceland. Uh, yeah. maybe one of our ver- very first trips uh, that, that we went there. Yeah. And uh, I guess this is something that you can find at the grocery store. And it used to be a pretty common thing that people would eat. Now, I don't know if it was like a staple. I, I don't think so. But, you know, it was you definitely would crack it out when friends would come over, I think. <laughs> it was one of those things you turn to when uh, the cupboard got bare, I think. Uh, <laughs> nowadays, I think uh, in a place like uh, Iceland... You can buy it uh, like beef jerky at the convenience store. I I don't but, think it's uh, that back popular. In the day, I think they, <laughs> back, back in the day, they dug it up from the beach or something. <laughs> yeah, it's like a giant shark. It's a Greenland shark, and it swims in these cold, deep waters between Iceland and Greenland. And occasionally, they get washed up on shore. And I don't know if they actually fish for them, but there's just a handful of them that get caught every year. And the tradition was, and you, you can't eat them outright because the, I guess the mussels produce ammonia and that's where it gets stored. And if you were to eat it, you were just going to poison yourself. And uh, and if you buried it under the sand and let it sit there for, I don't know, three, four months, the microbes would break it down or something. I, I don't yeah. know. Somehow they preserved it. Uh, maybe the acidity uh, preserved it. But that ammonia didn't go away. I mean, that's the that's the thing that went up and grabbed my brainstem. Uh. <laughs> well, we we had been doing this research project. Uh, you know, we had the absolute privilege of working in Iceland for you know over a decade on uh, on some on a, just a, a wonderful project. And uh, with uh, the help of our Icelandic colleagues and our our hosts there, we were introduced to all kinds of uh, Icelandic foods. And that was one of the first things I remember asking them was. Hey, can you, uh, you know, can you just introduce us? Can you show us some uh, some typical Icelandic foods? And, I remember when you were asking him that. I was thinking, no, don't ask him that, Claudio. <laughs> <laughs> well, just ask him where the pizza is. Well, Daddy's Pizza didn't open up until about ten years later, up in the little uh, village, <laughs> little hamlet where we were. And so our our colleague uh, said, okay, fine, I'll I'll make some food for you, and um, he. Uh, he dug in the freezer and uh, started boiling something, and a few hours later, he plopped uh, this thing on our plate, and it was mm. literally a half-sawn sheep's head mm. on the plate. Nothing mm. else. Very fleshy. Very fleshy. Very gummy skin, uh, very tan-colored. Uh, yeah. It the, the the And he just gave us a knife, and he said, this is all you have to eat it. A butter knife. A butter knife. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> it wasn't even a. It wasn't even a like a switchblade knife or something sharp to no. cut through that that flesh. It was just a butter knife. No, no fork, no nothing. He said, "This is it." Actually, there was a boiled potato next to it. I think that was the garnish. And then he very quickly said, 
oh, I have a meeting. I have to go. And he left very quickly. <laughs> and that, well, that they one. put a boiled potato next to it. And he also, um, fortunately, the only way that we were able to get through it, I th the only way I was able to get through it, is that he also gave us a little glass of lukewarm gin. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> with, a, with a squeeze of lemon in it. Well, and he said... It wasn't oh, enough, though. No, no, you, I'm st I still remember it. And, uh, and I remember him saying, oh, and don't forget, the best part is the eyeball. And then he mm. left. And uh, I think... As I recall, you couldn't really see the eyeball, so you were left wondering, is it in there? Am I going to have to dig it out? And yes, the answer is yes. And yes, the answer <laughs> is yes. And that's what the butter knife was for. <laughs> that's what the butter knife was for. <laughs> Among other things. Th that was pretty amazing. Now, I have to say, we've had other versions of sheep in Iceland uh, that were just amazing. Uh, um, the leg of lamb that they have there is uh, to die for. Okay, well, maybe not to die for, but it's uh, it's really just an amazing uh, thing. And All uh, relative. That, that's true. But... Um, you know, one of the things that uh, that I remember when we got off the plane, the first time we, we were in Iceland uh, together, we got into the airport in Keplavik and uh, we took our shuttle, the shuttle bus that took us into town. So Keplavik is like 20 miles out of town in the middle of this lava field. You're really, it seems like you're in the middle of nowhere. We got into town, we rented a, a pickup truck and we started driving north. And within five minutes, we had left habitations and it was just this immense grassland it was just incredible yeah. and i was totally unprepared for that i i just thought it was going to be rocks and uh the first thing that we saw was grassland vast vast grassland and i was it just took my breath away yeah no no houses no towns no villages it was just wide open and uh and then you start looking around and you realize that uh that there are inhabitants of this grassland and it's sheep and the sheep are just everywhere i mean well, not everywhere like there's just roaming you know herds of them but you know because iceland's a big country but they were just everywhere every every time you turn there's a couple of sheep or three sheep they were ubiquitous they they weren't that dense it wasn't like oh wow look at all those sheep it was just like every time you turned around there were the sheep they were there and and my initial thought was oh they got out you know like they the, <laughs> The fence, the, the farmer's fence broke and they got away. And shouldn't somebody, because they would cross the road, you know, we had to be careful not, not to hit them. And uh, I just thought, shouldn't somebody like get them back into their homes? And and eventually we learned that, uh, you know, the the farmers and the, the traditional way of uh, of keeping the, the sheep is really just after the, the lambing season in May, uh, the sheep are kind of taken up into the highlands, into these big grasslands, and they're just free to roam. And this is where they spend the entire summer. You were right. They had gotten out. <laughs> they had been let out. They had been let out. They had been let out. <laughs> and, uh, and so what, what we eventually learned was that, you know, the sheep are, are taken up into the highlands, um, and each family or group of families has jurisdiction or... Um, I don't know, control is too strong of a word. They have the rights to kind of a, a mm -hmm. valley or a set of uh, uh, valleys, and they right. just send their animals uh, up there. They've kind of been assigned to particular parts of the landscape, and uh, those assignments uh, seem to have some pretty deep history attached to them. It's not like uh, they wanted in a lottery this year or anything like that. It goes way back in the family. Oh, it goes it goes way back. Um and, um, you know, the, 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 the sheep stay up there. So then um, as the, the weather starts to get colder in September, kind of late August, early September, uh, the, it starts getting colder at the higher elevations. The sheep start coming down into the valleys. And uh, there's a, an annual kind of gathering of the sheep, the Roundup. Uh, it's called the Roundup. The, yep. The, the roundup, yeah, they um, the the rietir, I think, is what it's called, and it's a big community event. The families kind of go up in their horses, 
uh, they take their, uh, you know, and if you've ever seen the Icelandic horses, they're the, just these charming ponies with really long, uh, you know, bangs that kind of cover their eyes. They're kind of stocky and they're just perfect for riding up into the highlands. They have this tiny little gait that it looks like they're always on their tiptoes, kind of ta -ta 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 -ta, tiny little steps that it, uh, is supposed to be really good for like traversing the lava fields and really bouldery uh, sorts of things. They're little. They... They might be perfect for you, but I don't know if they'd be perfect for me. I mean, I, I know when I looked at them, I thought, I, I'm not getting on one of those. They're, I'm not a good horseman. I This would not be. <laughs> they are true. Well, the Roundup, as I recall, uh, some of the folks here that we were uh, chatting with uh, when we talked about the Roundup, they said, yeah, you know, a party, a big party. It they is go out in the hills. They, you know, they bring the fun stuff. They stay out there for a while. They, they do. And I remember talking to one of the farmers and I said, well, how many sheep do you take up into the highlands? And he goes, oh, this year, maybe my uh, herd was, um, you know, a hundred sheep. And I said, well, how many do you get back? You know, they're just roaming out in the countryside. And he, and he said, oh, I get them all back, you know, hundred <laughs> percent. Once in a while, you know, I lose In a good one. year, 125. <laughs> <laughs> So they bring them back down into the valleys, and obviously they're intermingled with all of the other families' sheep. And then they are, they have these uh, pens. Uh, some of the older ones are actually made out of stones. Uh, they they put them into the middle of the pens, and then somebody gets in there and like shoves them into these little side compartments, and they literally sort them. It's like you're being sorted back into your own family's pen. Uh, they must have ear tags or. They were probably painted or branded or something like that. It's like this giant scrum, you know, that, uh, you know, somebody gets in and wrestles these sheep and shoves them into the... It's the great sorting, like in uh, Harry Potter. Yeah. You know, they're sorting them. Yeah, the the, the sorting... Uh, uh, and there's just hundreds of these sorting pens all over the country. And <clears throat> I learned that, um, you know, there's probably over a million sheep roaming the countryside of, uh, of Iceland. Uh, that's yeah. how many... That's how many sheep are, are up there. And the lambs are uh, sold, and this is where we get our legs of lamb and so on. Uh, there's enough to kind of replace the herd in case some of the, uh, some of the mother sheep, the ewes, are getting older. Uh, but that's kind of how, how, things, how things are done. This, as, as we're you know, talking to our farmer friends and reading more about this, it's clear that the sheep... And the sheep culture, the, this rhythm of kind of bringing the, the, the sheep up to the highlands and back, back down is a rhythm that's just been occurring for, for hundreds of years. It's a really deeply embedded culture in the psyche of Iceland and Icelanders. Um, the Nobel laureate uh, for literature, Haldor Laxness, uh, wrote, The man who lives on his own land is an independent man. He is his own master. If he... If I can keep my sheep alive through the winter and can pay what has been stipulated from year to year, I assume he's talking about taxes uh, here, then I pay what's been stipulated and I have kept my sheep alive. No, it is freedom that we are all after, Titla. He who pays his way is king. He who keeps his sheep alive through the winter lives in a palace. I mean, that's, this was from... Uh, you know, he, he wrote a, a book called Independent People in uh, 1934, and it was really all about sheep and uh, the, yeah. the goings-on of life uh, centered around around sheep. Yeah, and they're, uh, they're fiercely independent people, no doubt about it, uh, like a lot of other people throughout the world. But uh, they, they do seem very attached to these uh, cultural um, um, ways that uh, have been handed down through the generations. The, the rhythm of the sheep moving uh, uh, from one place to another, uh, what we might call in, uh, in uh, academia transhumance. Hmm. Transhumance is the idea that um, the livestock spend part of the season or part of the year uh, in and around the barn or in and around the home, and then part of the season out in the, hmm. in the hinterlands, which is what we're talking about here when the, the sheep go up to the highlands. Mm -hmm. they're, they're going out and grazing on... Oh, well, what's more or less a wide open resource, but it's not just a commons. Some of the areas are actually, like we talked about, they're assigned to particular yeah. people. And who's to say, you know, where they're grazing at any particular time. But the idea is that there's uh, somebody's keeping track and there is at least enough land 
to support the animals that are out there. Right. So. What's, what's really fascinating about Iceland, as I started to learn more about the history and the culture, is that Iceland was pretty much empty of people uh, through the late 9th century. Uh, the Vikings were starting to roam the, the northern seas, um, and settlement uh, of Iceland was believed to have occurred sometime around the year 872, plus or minus a couple of years. And, um, and that's, when, uh, that's when Iceland got was was populated was populated how do how do they know exactly when they got there i mean plus or minus two years well this is one of the other themes of this uh of this uh podcast is that iceland is a really interesting uh place geologically uh also it's it has very active volcanoes and uh based on the type of ash and uh deposition from volcanic eruptions you can actually date the specific eruptions that happen from certain volcanoes to a particular time. And uh, so if you've got some uh, artifacts, some human habitations that occur sandwiched between two, these are called tephra layers, well, then you know that this is when it must have occurred. This particular you know, human uh, activity must have occurred between these, uh, these two different uh, geologic strata. And they happen frequently. So sort of like sort of like tree rings in the soil, huh? You can go down through the soil. In fact, you and I, uh, I've got some good video of you and I digging a soil pit where we were just, I don't know why we were doing it other than we were just fascinated <laughs> by the tephra layers. And yeah. some of the tephra layers were like uh, uh, several centimeters thick yeah. and uh, just amazing and white and chalky. Yeah. Almost like you could see them where they had been deposited uh, like it was yesterday. Uh, fantastic. I mean, these are like, can you imagine just like ash raining from the sky for enough time for it to then get compacted into a layer that is still visible today, a thousand years later, buried, you know, a meter or two under the soil. It's just, uh, you know, it must have been harrowing, you know, being in those uh, conditions uh, too. And, uh, you know, Iceland, another thing about Iceland is that it's just a touching the Arctic Circle. Uh, you know, the northern areas where we did our work were literally at the Arctic Circle. Uh, Reykjavik, uh, the south, is, you know, a, a few degrees uh, below the Arctic Circle. So it's, there's very short growing seasons. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, sun, you know, from uh, September till uh, May. You know, there's, uh, you're kind of on the dark That's side of the <laughs> yeah, yeah. On the other hand, in the summer, it's, uh, you know, you get 24-hour sun uh, almost uh it's it's just uh, just amazing and so agriculture is really hard to pull off in a traditional sense uh up there there's hard enough in a good year uh you might say but uh in a year where the volcano erupted or the several years afterwards when these when this ash was settling and just covering the grasses and the for the forages so that you couldn't really produce your sheep anymore that must have been devastating in yeah. fact we know it was devastating the not only did the sheep populations uh, crash in those years, the human populations crashed as well. Yeah. And uh, we know that this has had a tremendous effect on the genetic diversity of the human population in Iceland. Mm -hmm. I think it's well known to be sort of the, the narrowest a bit of genetic diversity in a particular uh, group of people uh, on the planet today. And that's largely because the volcanoes would uh, periodically sort of reset the population, if you will, and a few stragglers could survive on the coast, yep. uh, maybe uh, catching some salmon and that sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, from there, everything would start to grow again. So fascinating history. Yeah, the, the population during settlement, I think uh, about 30,000 colonists, uh, settlers uh, came over. And then the population just kind of hung around there for, you know, centuries, really. It never really got more than about 60,000, and it kept getting knocked uh, back. So I can imagine that it was just always life on the edge. Uh, starvation was right around the corner. Uh, a good sheep ear might have been that thing that kind of kept you from, from starving. And, uh, you know, you ate every single part of your animals uh, to get you through the winters, um, including the sheep's Not only that. Not only that, once they colonized, we know from the sagas, which are the written word of uh, folks from that the, back in the day there, and um, we also know from the um, paleo paleontological record that um, 
within about a 200-year period after colonization, they had, the people had completely denuded the island of trees. And so uh, the, the evidence is that there were uh, lots and lots of trees, birches, willows on this island that were, um, you know, used for firewood, used to burn uh, for uh, purpose to... Yep, they would make charcoal. Used to cook with. Yep. Yeah, used to make charcoal, etc. cetera. Uh, and now the island is almost uh, completely bereft of trees. Yeah. I mean, there are places where they have had massive campaigns to reforest uh, parts of the island, but uh, still it's it's pretty clear that, you know, there are very few, or, if any, trees across the island. Yeah, and in fact, they would use the sheep dung as uh, some of their fuel to actually heat up their, their houses. Uh, so you can imagine what that must have uh, smelled like, and uh, the indoor air quality was definitely <laughs> not, not very good. Gave some extra uh, uh, impetus for uh, rearing sheep, though. Yep. Not only were you using it for meat, you are using the dung to burn and to cook with and to warm yourself with. Uh, yeah. The sheep wool, that was another big uh, thing, was uh, you know the production of wool. Um, another thing that's worth mentioning is that Iceland was also very much isolated from the rest of the world. After that uh, kind of early settlement period, um, a lot of trade and uh, other routes were kind of cut off, and Iceland was under political control from Norway for a long time, and then from Denmark kind of as a, as a satellite uh, state. Uh, but there was there weren't really opportunities for a lot of trade, and so it was very much a self-reliant country until really the early 1900s when uh, uh, fishing started to take off, and um, and w the Iceland that we see today is really completely different than the Iceland of even just a hundred years ago. And and let's be honest, the Iceland that we see today is different than the Iceland of 15 years ago when you and I first started going there. Tourism has completely taken off. I mean, now this is the destination place. This is where, you know, movies are being made and Justin Bieber goes to do videos and, uh, you know, it's... And all because we started going there to count midges. All, all of that. <laughs> See what we cracked open? Well, it's a very sexy cosmopolitan place, especially Reykjavik. And the ease of travel to get there is, uh, you know, uh, uh, flying northern routes and that sort of thing. It's become a real hot hot spot for a stopover uh, between North America and Europe. And in fact, it is sort of uh, right there in the middle. It is the stopover between North America and Europe because the western half of the island is yep. on the North American continental plate. And the eastern half is on the Eurasian continental plate from a geological perspective. So... Just a fascinating place with respect to its geology. That, that, that geology is just amazing. And in fact, that, that junction of those two plates is uh, what we refer to as the Mid-Atlantic Rift. And right in that rift, the, the North American plate is moving you know, to the west at about one centimeter per year, and the Eurasian plate is moving to the east at about one centimeter a year. And right in the middle is where it's kind of ripping apart. And that's why you get all this geologic activity. And I'll never forget one of the most unique things that you and I had the opportunity to do was actually to go down into the fissure and uh, where you can kind of clamber down. And at the bottom of this fissure, we found a little area with, uh, that's, that's known by the locals there that is full of water. And this water is heated up naturally, these hot, natural hot springs to, you know, 105 degrees. I don't know. We cooked ourselves in, in that thing. It was about 105 degrees. <laughs> it night. was not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> it couldn't have been that healthy. And I remember we got down there and there were some locals down there and we started talking about the fact that one plate was North America and one was Eurasia and they were moving apart. And one of the locals got very grim faced and said, we don't talk about that in the fissure. <laughs> like <laughs> when we're down here, we don't, we don't talk of yeah. such things. Let's not talk. <laughs> give me a little pause. Yeah. That's amazing. But uh, I must say, being able to put, uh, I mean, the, this fissure was only uh, maybe, you know, eight feet across yeah. in some places, and I could reach and touch both sides mm -hmm. and uh, and have my hands uh, on one side the North American plate and the other the Eurasian plate. Fantastic. So this geologic history, as we kind of touched on before, kind of sets sets a bit of the, the, con the constraints on what you can do in terms of agriculture and even what you might be able to do in terms of raising animals uh, there. I mean, my understanding, uh, and you can uh, help uh, set the record straight here, is that uh, volcanic soils are actually quite fertile. 
because of all the nutrients that are kind of getting spewed out by from you know from from the middle of the earth. Uh, but there's very little organic uh, matter uh, in it, and therefore it's it doesn't hold together uh, very well. It's just very easy to be blown away, literally. Right. Very little of any, uh, essentially no uh, organic organic matter when it first gets laid down. Not only that, the minerals get laid down in a way that uh, there's very little consolidation of the material, and so it's easy to break up and wash away. We might think of it as not aggregating very well or holding together very well. It's the organic matter that eventually does come in that helps it start to ag aggregate a little bit and make the soils pretty productive. Um, but uh, they're hard to hold on to, as, as uh, Icelanders know. Uh, you mentioned that Iceland today looks a lot different than it did, you know, five or 10 years ago. If we think about 50 or 75 years ago, uh, Iceland had a lot more soil on its on on uh, on top of that rock they've had immense erosion uh problems uh that are related to its position out in the middle of the atlantic and incessant rain but really the underlying factor is these volcanic soils like that are very unconsolidated that don't aggregate well and uh the likely exacerbation of all that with uh overgrazing so uh, in the 1950s, the government there uh, put, put forth a very aggressive campaign of ramping up the number of sheep on the island to try and develop an export market. And I, I think the numbers are upwards of 2 million a head of sheep on the island. You mentioned that there's about a million today. Mm -hmm. And so they really, they really tried to squeeze what they could out of the resource. And there's a, it's very controversial. Um, as a re but I think a likely result is that they've had some massive erosion problems as a result of the overgrazing combined with this sort of inherently uh, uh, erodible, erosive soil. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's really stark to see areas that used to have two meters of soil on them with these really productive grasslands and a home right on the edge that is down to bedrock today. It is completely gone. Uh, yeah. and, uh, it's and you'll see these little islands that are kind of sticking, they call them rofabards, and they're these little islands where for whatever reason it didn't erode away, and it gives you this, I mean, it's not even an impression. You can just see how deep the soil had been, in some cases a couple of meters deep with very productive grassland on top of it, and it's just completely gone for basically as far as you can see. And in fact, if you look at Google Maps, you can see these massive areas uh, on the island where um, much of the soil, most of the soil is blown away into the Atlantic. And it's also uh, fair to point out that because of just the shape of Iceland, um, the prevailing winds and the moisture, that some of the some parts of the island actually receive very little rain. Uh, most of the rain is kind of in the south and in the southwest. Uh, the areas where we did our work were actually in the northeast uh, in the rain shadow of some of the ice caps there. And so you have the added exacerbation of low temperature, low productivity, um, and uh, not a lot of water to get those plants actually growing. And when you put those things together and then you add a little ash from a volcano on top of that and you overgraze it with sheep, that's a recipe for uh, some, some pretty bad soil degradation, I think. Yeah. And so what's really interesting here is like there's this tension between this uh, kind of cultural practice, but also kind of an important agricultural practice that really was important in in uh, sustaining the populations for a really long time, juxtaposed, overlaid on top of these uh, soils and uh, environmental conditions that sometimes are in your favor, but sometimes are not. You're just always on the knife's edge on what the land can tolerate in terms of the number of sheep makes it critical to think about managing adaptively, uh, managing livestock, for instance, in a way that you can uh, be flexible with respect to what's trending in terms of the climate, in terms of your soils, et cetera. And it really is a sort of a, uh, an important uh, a tale, an important lesson for the way we manage resources everywhere. In Iceland, though, it's a place where uh, the resource, the combination of resources is sort of so precarious I don't want to say fragile, I don't really like that term, but it's it's just precarious because 
if, if you uh, 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 over extract the resource one year, two years in a row, you can result in decades of devastation mm -hmm. for a particular place. And, and so you uh, just have to be, you have to watch what you're doing when you manage those resources. There's no formula. You can't repeat the same thing every year. You really have to be paying a lot of attention. And that's where kind of the knowledge of the land and the the experience of the, the farmers and uh, of the land, I think is really important too. Critically, sheep are part of the Icelandic culture, their identity, what it means to be Icelandic. Iceland has shaped its people, a harsh environment of lava, snow, slow-growing plants, isolated from Europe, forces which have shaped the identity and the culture of the Icelanders. But Icelanders have also shaped their own land and in ways that might actually have undermined their ability to sustain themselves. The extreme nature of the environment in Iceland allows us to see these dynamics much more clearly in a place like this, but really the same forces are at play around the world. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our first podcast. If you like it, click on the thumbs up button in our YouTube channel. If you don't like it, well, I hope you like it. Talk to you guys soon.